Hello and welcome to Games from Folktales, a podcast that mixes historical research and tabletop role-playing settings. I'm your host, Timothy Ferguson. This week, a story from M.R. James. It's one of his earlier stories, and it contains a character who would make an excellent apprentice, or would be suitable as a plot hook for a Bonasagus magus who keeps losing his apprentices. I'll pop up to spoil the story on the way through. The following recording was made by Peter Yearsley and released into the public domain through LibriVox. Thank you, Peter. Lost Hearts Recorded by Peter Yearsley It was, as far as I can ascertain, in September of the year 1811 that a post-chaise drew up before the door of Azelby Hall in the heart of Lincolnshire. The little boy who was the only passenger in the chaise, and who jumped out as soon as it had stopped, looked about him with the keenest curiosity during the short interval that elapsed between the ringing of the bell and the opening of the hall door. He saw a tall, square, red-brick house, built in the reign of Anne. A stone-pillared porch had been added in the purer classical style of 1790. The windows of the house were many, tall and narrow, with small panes, and thick white woodwork. A pediment, pierced with a round window, crowned the front. There were wings to the right and left, connected by curious glazed galleries supported by colonnades, with the central block. These wings plainly contained the stables and offices of the house. Each was surmounted by an ornamental cupola with a gilded vane. An evening light shone on the building, making the window panes glow like so many fires. Away from the hall in front stretched a flat park studded with oaks and fringed with firs, which stood out against the sky. The clock in the church tower, buried in trees on the edge of the park, only its golden weathercock catching the light, was striking six, and the sound came gently beating down the wind. It was altogether a pleasant impression, though tinged with the sort of melancholy appropriate to an evening in early autumn that was conveyed to the mind of the boy who was standing in the porch, waiting for the door to open to him. I was tempted to cut off those two paragraphs, but I've kept them for atmosphere. This house exists in the real world, and M. R. James's neighbours kept getting letters asking them if their house really was haunted, or if the terrible events to be described had actually happened there, which may be why, in his later stories, he begins just making towns up. The post-chaise had brought him from Warwickshire, where, some six months before, he had been left an orphan. Now, owing to the generous offer of his elderly cousin, Mr. Abney, he had come to live at Aswerby. The offer was unexpected, because all who knew anything of Mr. Abney looked upon him as a somewhat austere recluse, into whose steady-going household the advent of a small boy would import a new and, it seemed, incongruous element. The truth is that very little was known of Mr. Abney's pursuits or temper. The professor of Greek at Cambridge had been heard to say that no one knew more of the religious beliefs of the later pagans than did the owner of Azubi. Certainly his library contained all the then available books bearing on the mysteries, the Orphic poems, the worship of Mithras, and the Neoplatonists. In the marble-paved hall stood a fine group of Mithras slaying a bull, which had been imported from the Levant at great expense by the owner. He had contributed a description of it to the gentleman's magazine, and he had written a remarkable series of articles in the Critical Museum on the superstitions of the Romans of the Lower Empire. He was looked upon, in fine, as a man wrapped up in his books, and it was a matter of great surprise among his neighbours that he should ever have heard of his orphan cousin, Stephen Elliot, much more than he should have volunteered to make him an inmate of Azerby Hall. 
We know a lot more about Mithras and the Neoplatonists than James's readers did. Presumably, much as Christians have a dark oppositional force in the Satanists, the Mithranists had a shadow. Perhaps this is where the shadow flambeau in the Iberian Tribunal book came from. Whatever may have been expected by his neighbours, it is certain that Mr. Abney, the tall, the thin, the austere, seemed inclined to give his young cousin a kindly reception. The moment the front door was opened, he darted out of his study, rubbing his hands with delight. "'How are you, my boy? How are you? How old are you?' said he. "'That is, you're not too much tired, I hope, by your journey to eat your supper.' "'No, thank you, sir,' said Master Elliot. "'I am pretty well.' "'That's a good lad,' said Mr. Abney. "'And how old are you, my boy?' It seemed a little odd that he should have asked the question twice in the first two minutes of their acquaintance. "'I'm twelve years old next birthday, sir,' said Stephen. "'And when is your birthday, my dear boy? Eleventh of September, eh? "'That's well, that's very well. Nearly a year hence, isn't it? I like, <laughs> I like to get these things down in my book. Sure it's twelve? Mm, certain? Yes, quite sure, sir. Well, well. Um, take him to Mrs. Bunch's room, Parks, and let him have his tea, supper, whatever it is. Yes, sir, answered the staid Mr. Parks, and conducted Stephen to the lower regions. So, what's the deal with Abney's book? It appears to be an evil bullet journal, or perhaps, as they would have called it at the time, a commonplace book. It survives the process of the story, so the bullet journal of pure evil is still around somewhere and is technically a treasure at the conclusion. Mrs. Bunch was the most comfortable and human person whom Stephen had as yet met at Azerby. She made him completely at home, they were great friends in a quarter of an hour, and great friends they remained. Mrs. Bunch had been born in the neighbourhood some fifty-five years before the date of Stephen's arrival, and her residence at the hall was of twenty years standing. Consequently, if any one knew the ins and outs of the house and the district, Mrs. Bunch knew them, and she was by no means disinclined to communicate her information. So she has a high area law score and the gossip floor. Certainly, there were plenty of things about the hall and the hall gardens which Stephen, who was of an adventurous and inquiring turn, was anxious to have explained to him. Who built the temple at the end of the laurel walk? Who was the old man whose picture hung on the staircase, sitting at a table with a skull under his hand? These and many similar points were cleared up, by the resources of Mrs. Bunch's powerful intellect. There were others, however, of which the explanations furnished were less satisfactory. The skull thing is probably a momentum mori. These are items which are meant to draw your attention toward your own mortality so that you mend your character. They act as a sort of external personality trait which you can use to resist temptation, although, in this case, Abney seems to be using it for something else. One November evening, Stephen was sitting by the fire in the housekeeper's room, reflecting on his surroundings. "'Is Mr. Abney a good man, and will he go to heaven?' he suddenly asked, with the peculiar confidence which children possess in the ability of their elders to settle these questions, the decision of which is believed to be reserved for other tribunals." "'Good bless the child,' said Mrs. Bunch. "'Master's as kind a soul as ever I see. "'Didn't I never tell you of the little boy as he took in out of the street, "'as you may say, this seven years back, and the little girl, two years after I first come here?' "'No, do tell me all about them, Mrs. Bunch. "'Now, this minute.' "'Well,' said Mrs. Bunch, "'the little girl I don't seem to recollect so much about.' I know Master brought her back with him from his walk one day, and give orders to Mrs. Ellis, as, as was housekeeper then, as she should be took every care with. And the poor child hadn't no one belonging to her. She told me so her own self, and here she lived with us a matter of three weeks, it might be, 
and then, whether she was something of a gypsy in her blood or what not, but one morning she, out of her bed afore any of us had opened an eye, and neither track nor yet trace of her, have I set eyes on since. Master was wonderful put about, and had all the ponds dragged, but it's my belief she was had away by them gypsies, for there was singing around the house for as much as an hour the nights she went and Parks, he declares he heard them a-callin' in the woods all that afternoon. Dear, dear, a hod child she was, so silent in her ways and all, but I was wonderful taken up with her, so domesticated she was, surprising. So what's the deal with the singing? Is that Abney doing his work? Is it a creature responding to him? Is it the gypsies attempting some sort of magic to counter him? And what about the little boy? said Stephen. "'Ah, oh, that poor boy,' sighed Mrs. Bunch. "'He were a foreigner. Jeveny, he called himself, and he come a-tweakin' his hurdy-gurdy round and about the drive one winter day, and Master had him in that minute, and asked all about where he came from, and how old he was, and how he made his way, and where was his relatives, and all as kind as heart could wish. But it went the same way with him.' They're a unruly lot, them foreign nations, I do suppose, and he was off one fine morning just the same as the girl. Why he went and what he done was our question for as much as a year after, for he never took his hurdy gurdy, and there it lays on the shelf. The remainder of the evening was spent by Stephen in miscellaneous cross examination of Mrs. Bunch, and in efforts to extract a tune from the hurdy gurdy. There were hurdy gurdies in twelve twenty. There were hurdy gurdies in twelve twenty in Europe. They're a little bit different in terms of their keying from the modern hurdy gurdy, but they're still basically a cranked violin that sounds a bit like a bagpipe. Does touching the hurdy gurdy summon up the creatures which threaten and save Stephen? That night he had a curious dream. At the end of the passage, at the top of the house, in which his bedroom was situated, there was an old disused bathroom. It was kept locked, but the upper half of the door was glazed, and, since the muslin curtains which used to hang there had long been gone, you could look in and see the lead-lined bath affixed to the wall on the right hand, with its head towards the window. On the night of which I am speaking, Stephen Elliot found himself, as he thought, looking through the glazed door. The moon was shining through the window, and he was glazing at a figure which lay in the bath. His description of what he saw reminds me of what I once beheld myself in the famous vaults of St. Michan's Church in Dublin, which possesses the horrid property of preserving corpses from decay for centuries. A figure inexpressibly thin and pathetic, of a dusty leaden colour, enveloped in a shroud-like garment, the thin lips crooked into a faint and dreadful smile, the hands pressed tightly over the region of the heart. As he looked upon it, a distant, almost inaudible moan seemed to issue from its lips, and the arms began to stir. The terror of the sight forced Stephen backwards, and he awoke to the fact that he was indeed standing on the cold boarded floor of the passage, in the full light of the moon. With a courage which I do not think can be common among boys of his age, he went to the door of the bathroom to ascertain if the figure of his dreams were really there. It was not, and he went back to bed. Ghosts which cause nightmares are relatively rare. All demons have an innate power to dreamwalk, however, so it's possible that rather than a ghost this is a minor demon. Mrs. Bunch was much impressed next morning by his story, and went so far as to replace the muslin curtain over the glazed door of the bathroom. Mr. Abney, moreover, to whom he confided his experiences at breakfast, was greatly interested, and made notes of the matter in what he called his book. The spring equinox was approaching, as Mr. Abney frequently reminded his cousin, adding that this had been always considered by the ancients to be a critical time for the young, 
The Romans, for example, had the Liberalia at this point of the year, which was the time when young men became men through a process of ritual investiture. Something similar occurs in sections of the Order of Hermes. I believe it happens in the Alps, for example. That Stephen would do well to take care of himself, and to shut his bedroom window at night, and that Censorinus had some valuable remarks on the subject. Two incidents that occurred about this time made an impression upon Stephen's mind. The first was after an unusually uneasy and oppressed night that he had passed, though he could not recall any particular dream that he had had. The following evening Mrs. Bunch was occupying herself in mending his nightgown. "'Gracious me, Master Stephen,' she broke forth rather irritably, "'how do you manage to tear your night-dress all to flinders this way? Look here, sir, what trouble you do give to poor servants that have to darn and mend after you?' There was, indeed, a most destructive and apparently wanton series of slits or scorings in the garment which would undoubtedly require a skilful needle to make good. They were confined to the left side of the chest, long, parallel slits about six inches in length, some of them not quite piercing the texture of the linen. Stephen could only express his entire ignorance of their origin. He was sure they were not there the night before. Is this a threat? It doesn't seem to be an effective attack. Is it a warning? But he said, Mrs. Bunch, they're just the same as the scratches on the outside of my bedroom door, and I'm sure I never had anything to do with making them. Mrs. Bunch gazed at him open-mouthed, then snatched up a candle, departed hastily from the room, and was heard making her way upstairs. In a few minutes she came down. Well, she said, Master Stephen, it's a funny thing to me how them marks and scratches can have come there too high up for any cat or dog to have made em, much less a rat, for all the world like a Chinaman's fingernails, as my uncle in the tea trade used to tell us of when we was girls together. I wouldn't say nothing to Master, not if I was you, Master Stephen, my dear, and just turn the key of the door when you go up to your bed. I always do, Mrs. Bunch, as soon as I've said my prayers. Ah, oh, that's a good child. Always say your prayers, and then no one can't hurt you. Is she right there? Mrs. Bunch doesn't seem to be harmed by these creatures. Is praying a ward? Herewith, Mrs. Bunch addressed herself to mending the injured nightgown, with intervals of meditation, until bedtime. This was on a Friday night in March, 1812. On the following evening, the usual duet of Stephen and Mrs. Bunch was augmented by the sudden arrival of Mr. Parks, the butler, who as a rule kept himself rather to himself in his own pantry. He did not see that Stephen was there. He was moreover flustered, and less slow of speech than was his wont. "'Master may get up his own wine if he likes of an evening,' was his first remark. "'Either I do it in the daytime, or not at all, Mrs. Bunch. I don't know what it may be. Very like it's the rats, or the wind got into the cellars, but I'm not so young as I was and I can't go through with it, as I have done. Well, Mr. Parks, you know it is a surprising place for the rats, is the hole. I am not denying that, Mrs. Bunch, and to be sure many a time I've heard the tale from the men in the shipyards about the rat that could speak. I never laid no confidence in that before, but to-night, if I'd demeaned myself to lay my ear on the door of the further bin, I could pretty much have heard what they were saying. Oh, there, Mr. Park, I've no patience with your fancies. Rats talking in the wine cellar, indeed. Well, Mrs. Bunch, I've no wish to argue with you. All I say is, if you choose to go to the far bin and lay your ear to the door, you may prove my words this minute. What are they saying? Are they asking for help? If they're fairies, they could just be being spooky for the sake of being spooky to rise fear in humans. What nonsense you do talk, Mr. Parks not fit for children to listen to. Why, you'll be frightening Master Stephen there out of his wits. What? Master Stephen? said Parks, awaking to the consciousness of the boy's presence. 
Master Stephen knows well enough when I am playing a joke with you, Mrs. Bunch. In fact, Master Stephen knew much too well to suppose that Mr. Parks had in the first instance intended a joke. He was interested, not altogether pleasantly, in the situation, but all his questions were unsuccessful in inducing the butler to give any more detailed account of his experiences in the wine-cellar. We have now arrived at March the 24th, 1812. It was a day of curious experiences for Stephen, a windy, noisy day, which filled the house and the gardens with a restless impression. As Stephen stood by the fence of the grounds, and looked out into the park, he felt as if an endless procession of unseen people were sweeping past him on the wind, borne on resistlessly and aimlessly, vainly striving to stop themselves, to catch at something that might arrest their flight, and bring them once again into contact with the living world of which they had formed a part. This is a sort of Dickensian limbo. There are magicians who shepherd processions of the dead like this. It's easier for them to perform their rituals in areas where magic auras are high, or on certain nights associated with the gathering of the dead. After luncheon that day, Mr. Abney said, Stephen, my boy, do you think you could manage to come to me tonight, as late as eleven o'clock in my study? I shall be busy until that time, and I wish to show you something connected with your future life, which it is most important that you should know. You are not to mention this matter to Mrs. Bunch, nor to anyone else in the house, and you had better go to your room at the usual time. Here was a new excitement added to life. Stephen eagerly grasped at the opportunity of sitting up till eleven o'clock. He looked in at the library door on his way upstairs that evening, and saw a brazier, which he had often noticed in the corner of the room, moved out before the fire. An old silver gilt cup stood on the table, filled with red wine, and some written sheets of paper lay near it. Mr. Abney was sprinkling some incense on the brazier from a round silver box as Stephen passed, but did not seem to notice his step. The wind had fallen, and there was a still night and a full moon. At about ten o'clock Stephen was standing at the open window of his bedroom, looking out over the country. Still as the night was, the mysterious population of the distant moonlit woods was not yet lulled to rest. From time to time strange cries, as of lost and despairing wanderers, sounded from across the mere. They might be the notes of owls or water-birds, yet they did not quite resemble either sound. Were they not coming nearer? Now they sounded from the nearer side of the water and in a few moments they seemed to be floating about among the shrubberies. Then they ceased. But just as Stephen was thinking of shutting the window and resuming his reading of Robinson Crusoe, he caught sight of two figures standing on the gravelled terrace that ran along the garden side of the hall, the figures of a boy and girl, as it seemed. They stood side by side, looking up at the windows. Something in the form of the girl recalled irresistibly his dream of the figure in the bath. The boy inspired him with more acute fear. Whilst the girl stood still, half smiling, with her hands clasped over her heart, the boy, a thin shape with black hair and ragged clothing, raised his arms in the air with an appearance of menace and of unappeasable hunger and longing. The moon shone upon his almost transparent hands, and Stephen saw that the nails were fearfully long, and that the light shone through them. As he stood with his arms thus raised, he disclosed a terrifying spectacle. On the left side of his chest there opened a black and gaping rent and there fell upon Stephen's brain, rather than upon his ear, the impression of one of those hungry and desolate cries that he had heard resounding over the woods of Azobi all that evening. In another moment this dreadful pair had moved swiftly and noiselessly over the dry gravel, 
and he saw them no more. Ghostly waters in Ars Magica never seem to have useful things like these claws, but I think that would be an excellent design for an apprentice with this virtue. I particularly like the idea that much as a hamir, a type of skinwalker werebear from the Norse area above where the order is prevalent, can step inside their animal fantasticum so that if you cut the bear through the skin, you can see the person's clothing underneath. So a child could be surrounded by their ghostly water, gaining the claws, terrifying visage, and soul-wrenching moan. Inexpressibly frightened as he was, he determined to take his candle and go down to Mr. Abney's study, for the hour appointed for their meeting was near at hand. The study, or library, opened out of the front hall on one side, and Stephen, urged on by his terrors, did not take long in getting there. To effect an entrance was not so easy. It was not locked, he felt sure, for the key was on the outside of the door as usual. His repeated knocks produced no answer. Mr. Abney was engaged. He was speaking. What? Why did he try to cry out? And why was the cry choked in his throat? Had he, too, seen the mysterious children? But now everything was quiet, and the door yielded to Stephen's terrified and frantic pushing. On the table in Mr. Abney's study certain papers were found which explained the situation to Stephen Elliot when he was of an age to understand them. The most important sentences were as follows. It was a belief very strongly and generally held by the ancients, of whose wisdom in these matters I have had such experience as induces me to place confidence in their assertions, that by enacting certain processes which to us moderns have something of a barbaric complexion, a very remarkable enlightenment of the spiritual faculties in man may be attained that, for example, by absorbing the personalities of a certain number of his fellow creatures, an individual may gain a complete ascendancy over those orders of spiritual beings which control the elemental forces of our universe. In Ars Magica, these elemental forces may be elementals. M. R. James would have called them spirits. Alternatively, perhaps a demonic familiar is summoned, and that familiar acts as a, a proxy, doing the will of the person who has summoned them. It is recorded of Simon Magus that he was able to fly in the air, to become invisible, or to assume any form he pleased, by the agency of the soul of a boy whom, to use the libellous phrase employed by the author of the Clementine Recognitions, he had murdered. I find it set down, moreover, with considerable detail in the writings of Hermes Trismegistus, that similar happy results may be produced by the absorption of the hearts of not less than three human beings below the age of twenty-one years. To the testing of the truth of this recipe I have devoted the greater part of the last twenty years, selecting as the corpora villia of my experiment such persons as could conveniently be removed without occasioning a sensible gap in society. The first step I effected by the removal of one Phoebe Stanley, a girl of gypsy extraction, on March the 22nd, 1792, the second by the removal of a wandering Italian lad named Giovanni Paoli on the night of March the 23rd, 1805, the final victim, to employ a word repugnant in the highest degree to my feelings, must be my cousin Stephen Elliot. His day must be this March 24th, 1812. There's a certain mathematics underlying the dates in this procedure that slow it down. Apparently you can't just kill and absorb three people on the same night, thereby gaining tremendous powers which protect you from mundane reprisal. The best means of effecting the required absorption is to remove the heart from the living subject to reduce it to ashes, and to mingle them with about a pint of some red wine, preferably port. I'm presuming here by port he either means fortified wine as a class, or fortified wine specifically from Porto, a city in Iberia, which as the name suggests is in modern Portugal. It seems a strange addition, 
Strabo mentions Iberian wine, but I can't work out why it should be superior for this purpose. Fortified Portuguese wine isn't known in 1220, in as far as I can tell. I would like to flag that there is another Iberian link here to the Shadow Flambeau, who were active in that tribunal, and it has the fig leaf of Mithraic practice. The remains of the first two subjects, at least, it will be well to conceal. A disused bathroom or wine cellar will be found convenient for such a purpose. Some annoyance may be experienced from the psychic portion of the subjects, which popular language dignifies with the name of ghosts, but the man of philosophic temperament, to whom alone the experiment is appropriate, will be little prone to attach importance to the feeble efforts of these beings to wreak their vengeance on him. Presumably he didn't learn his wards. Odd that you need to keep the bodies around. The ghosts may be tied to the bodies, and they may be absorbed as part of the third ritual. I contemplate with the liveliest satisfaction the enlarged and emancipated existence which the experiment, if successful, will confer on me, not only placing me beyond the reach of human justice, so-called, but eliminating, to a great extent, the prospect of death itself. What's the mechanism at play here? Is this just a demon who's promising all kinds of things that they're not going to deliver? Does this act as a version of the becoming ritual, turning a person into a dark fairy? Is it ascension into a shadowy, evil version of the Hall of Heroes? It's not clear. Mr. Abney was found in his chair, his head thrown back, his face stamped with an expression of rage, fright, and mortal pain. In his left side was a terrible lacerated wound exposing the heart. There was no blood on his hands, and a long knife that lay on the table was perfectly clean. A savage wildcat might have inflicted the injuries. The window of the study was open, and it was the opinion of the coroner that Mr. Abney had met his death by the agency of some wild creature. But Stephen Elliot's study of the papers I have quoted led him to a very different conclusion. Stephen seems like an excellent apprentice candidate. He's brave, he has the second sight because he can see ghosts, and he comes with his own country estate. Your saga may vary.